Wow, what a week. Just uh, we're so grateful for everyone who contributed. We'll mention some more of that just at the end here. But it takes a lot of people serving together to make such an extraordinary time for the young generation. And uh, just think of one, uh, one thing I want to mention as you were just talking about the outreach with the inner city children, uh, which we love, we absolutely love. If you know the history of this ministry, it's what we started with in this community for many, many years. Uh, but the, the leader of that particular church, Mount Carmel uh, Church, uh, he passed away yesterday. And uh, Bishop Marcus Campbell, a good friend of mine, and uh, one of my favorite pastors in the city, literally. And uh, he had been uh, with heart trouble. He had been in the hospital for about well, close to a month. But we just heard yesterday at 3 p.m. he passed away. And uh, just want to mention that because he was really a, an example, just such an, a profound example of a man. I started off the, the first uh, message Monday night here about the power of a yes, just the power of your yes when you say yes to God. He was a man who, who said yes to God after he had been in all kinds of trouble as a young man, drugging and thugging, and, you know, he had been in, in prison and everything, you know, just some, sadly sometimes a typical, the plight of the inner city, he had kind of lived that. And he, came, he got saved in prison, but he came out of prison and he was kind of terrified to come out, feeling like, am I just going to fall back in to my old patterns? And uh, so he, he had gotten a part-time job. And um, so he was walking uh, right, right in this area, right down this street here. And someone told him, he said, hey, there's a, uh, a Christian nightclub right down the road. That's what they called this place back in the day, um, <laughs> Christian nightclub. <laughs> you never know what people are going to call you. Um, but anyways, um, he, he was afraid because it was Friday night and he, was, he could feel the, the darkness encroaching. Like, am I going to fall back in to what I used to be? And instead, he decided to check out the Christian nightclub. And he came in here and we, we met each other. I lost track of him in the early days. He would come in here on Friday nights and this worship. He said he thought he was in heaven. He came in, there's people dancing. And he said, there was this guy doing this karate type worship dance. I never, think, I never seen such freedom. And, and he just got rocked. But, and he said this was like the stepping stone because he was too ashamed to come into a regular church in his early years when he first got out. So he would come here on Friday nights. We, we lost track of each other. And the, the tornado that came a few years back brought us together where his, the roof of his church, he had gone on and become a pastor and a bishop. And, and uh, the roof of his church was taken off. And we were over there just serving. And all of a sudden he hears, uh, I'm the guy from the foundry. That's what this building was known at, the foundry. And he goes, the foundry, whoa. And he goes, and him and I just reunite like, like good old buddies from like, you know, literally 28 years ago or something. And so we were able to join together and serve what they're doing with the inner city children, which is profound. They have 150 to 200 kids every summer. And uh, he's already been in the paper many times. He's so loved in this city. He's a real hero in the faith, a father to the fatherless. So be, please be praying for Miss Stacy. That's his wife, and they, they have I think six children, and a whole community here. So we just found this news, but we love him dearly. And I'll tell you, he's another one is a seed that's going to multiply. Uh, he's he's one of the finest leaders in the city, and uh, for whatever reason the Lord saw fit to take him home, he's with Jesus, and we're celebrating with him. But we want to uh, stand uh, in agreement, just covering. Uh, the church and the family. So let's just pray for a moment. Father, we thank you for Bishop Marcus. What a profound story, Lord. Uh, of, what a turnaround and, and what a, uh, a man of multiplication he became, Lord, sowing the gospel into this city, into the young generation and gang prevention and all the things he's been doing. We just give you praise for his friendship, for his yes, and let it multiply, Lord. And we cover Miss Stacy and his children now. Just be with them, Lord. Comfort them supernaturally, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. And thanks to Anthony. He told me, he said, hey, here's the guy you got to go meet. So little did I know I knew him from back in the day. But. Okay, so, um, yeah, you guys ready for the word of the Lord? Um, we've had some amazing teaching times this week, and 
and uh, we revere the Word of God. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read to you just a short passage from the book of Numbers, book of Numbers, jumping in on the story um, of the Israelites trying to make it into the promised land. And, you know, that took them a long time to finally get there. But this, jumping in at verse 28. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. In this desert, your bodies will fall. Every one of, of you 20 years old or more who was counted in the census and who grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, the son of Zephaniah, and Joshua, the son of Nun. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them into enjoy the land that you have rejected. But you, your bodies will fall in the desert. Please be seated. So I'm going to talk to you this morning. I'm going to go kind of quick because we're just going to, we're going to tag also a blessing for these young ones. And uh, how, many, how many Thunder Campers we got up in here that represent? All right, all right, all right. Woo-hoo! Uh, awesome group. And uh, such a joy, such a privilege. Thanks to all the parents that entrust these young ones with us. Um, but it's one of our favorite times of the year, Thunder Camp, because we just know it's exponential growth and fruit. It's multiplied. And, you know, it's one thing to get someone saved at the end of their life, like the thief on the cross. It's profound, a soul saved. But it's something when someone gets lit up when they're young and they still got a whole life to live, a whole life to give the gospel. Isn't that awesome? I remember back in the day when we first started in the hood, the Lord said uh, we didn't know where to begin. It was just so much decades of dysfunction and addiction and violence and everything that was happening. We're just like, Lord, I don't have a clue. And he said, start with the children. The younger, the better. Get them. <laughs> and so we, we took that to heart. And we had many years working with children, and we love it. And, uh, but there's something about teenagers, right? Something about teenagers. Now, I just think it's, it's the hot spot. It's the, it's the place. If you can get a teenager, I'm telling you, because they're really starting to step into who they're going to become and forging the character and identity and making already life choices and decisions. And so I want to talk to you about um, this generation that's emerging of teenagers, young people. Um, so many people have coined the phrase Gen Z, Gen Z. And I, I would hear that phrase, and I'd be like, I don't know what I think about that. It sounds kind of, kind of final, you know, Z is at the end. And uh, I, I asked the Lord about it. I was like, Lord, what do you call this generation? And he said, it's, I don't call it Z. I call it zeal, Gen Zeal. And, uh, and I really believe because that's their destiny is to have tremendous zeal for the Lord. It's not, and so zeal, it just means great energy and enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective to have passion, to have love, to have fervor, fire, devotion, enthusiasm, eagerness, keenness. Woo, come on, energy. And I believe that out of a place where people think, well, they're apathetic or they're just addicted to their phones and we don't know, you know, we're not sure about the future of America. Everything's shaking and you look at the young generation. There's a lot of negative words that are being spoken all the way around. I mean, but even towards this young generation. And I want to, I want to suggest to you, don't do that. <laughs> Prophesy life. Prophesy life. Learn to see one another with the eyes of the Spirit and speak those words, those words. You see this passage we just read, it's actually kind of concerning as the Lord takes them at their word. In Numbers chapter 14 says, As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. In this desert your bodies will fall. Wow. He said he heard them grumbling and complaining. It's like, we're going to just die out here. We're never going to, you know, it's better, they were talking about crazy stuff. It's better to go back to, let's get a new leader. Let's go back to Egypt. And so just such negativity. And you know, let me tell you something. God doesn't play with that stuff. He'll let you grumble for a while. He'll let you say some things. But after a while, he's like, okay, I'll take you at your word. You want to keep speaking death? You're going to live it. That's what happened to these guys, tragically. Could you imagine a whole generation Dying in a desert because of their attitude. I'm telling you, your attitude affects your, your altitude. How, how high you're going to go in the kingdom. How far you're going to go with Jesus. And so don't ever belittle 
or, or think less of just, oh, it's just an attitude. This got to get a little grumpy at it. No, I'm telling you, it can be exceedingly dangerous for your spiritual future. Does this make sense? And so, so the, uh, also another, I want to I talk to you about this passage here where it says here, as for your children, they will be, this, it says, this is what they're saying. Our children will be taken as plunder. And that's what they were saying. He goes, no, we can't go forward in that promised land. It's too dangerous. They got giants. They got strongholds. They got fortified cities. What will happen to our women and children? That was their excuse. They had forgotten they're following the living God, the maker of heaven and earth. And they're saying, well, let's blame it on the kid. We got kids. We're concerned for the children. I'm telling you, don't belittle the children. I'm telling you, the children are the greatest warriors. If you point them the right direction, if they get lit, if they get some zeal, I'm telling you, they're going to turn this, they're going to flip the script. Young people have a, an advantage that older people don't, you know, when you become an adult, when you get a little older, you're a suspect. <laughs> you're just, I mean, but when you see a young generation just on fire, come on, you guys, and they're just lit up for Jesus, people, the, all the older generation just kind of look and go, what's got into them? I mean, that's revolutionary stuff right there. When a young generation begins to get ignited. Woo, come on, someone. I'm talking to someone up in here. This is a message for all generations, okay? Everyone's going to get slapped on this one. All right, you ready for this? <laughs> and so he's, the other translation says uh, that our, our children will be, be, be taken as victims. And I think a lot of times we look at the young generation, Gen Zeal, I don't call them Z anymore, Gen Zeal, and, but people will say, Oh, they're victims. It's, it's, I mean, look what they're inheriting. Look at the mess. Look at the nations are shaking. Look at the debt. Look at, you can go on and on. Look at the addiction. And, and, and people can just kind of like begin to go lose hope or just write them off. I'm telling you, God's got a plan. He's going to turn this whole thing around. And all he needs is a few good ones. Man, he turned the whole world upside down with 12. And a lot of people believe that the disciples were still teenagers, most of them, like 17, 18, 19. I'm telling you, God wants to do something with a generation. But it's generations, as you'll see as we look into this story, okay? Um, Numbers 14, a parallel passage says, but your little ones whom you have said will be victims, I will bring in. I will bring in. And, uh, and it says, in the land that you despise, the land that you rejected, the, the promise, the destination of God, where God wants to take a nation, take a generation. He says, you, you, you reject that. You despise that. And Deuteronomy chapter 1, 39 says, And the little ones that you said would be taken captive, your children who do not yet know God, or sorry, do not yet know good from bad, they will enter the land. So you think of the times when right now when right is wrong and, and wrong is right and evil and good is all switched up. And, and you look at, and they're saying here there's a generation of children that you said were going to be a bunch of captives to all this madness and this confusion, and that they don't know right from wrong. And he says, but there will be the very ones who will enter the land. And as for you, well, we'll see what side the older generation falls on. Because there was a, if you think of a whole generation dying in, a, in the desert, the ones who, who saw the great wonders of God, the great deeds of the Most High, the plagues, and they saw they, the ones who walked through, if you can imagine walking through the Red Sea being open before your eyes. You're like walking on dry land, looking at, you know, <laughs> there's fish in there. You know, you're, you're looking all around and you're seeing, you're living the dream. You're, you're walking through the miracles and yet somehow their hearts were hardened. I'm telling you, just because you saw the power of God in your younger years or you saw uh, God moving in one generation doesn't mean you're going to be, you have what it takes to get all the way through. You got to be a Joshua. You got to be a Caleb. And the Bible says they were of a different spirit. Come on, someone. Because you know what? The crowd is usually wrong. Huh. So the big question is are you following the, the crowd or the cloud? And the crowd, the grumbling, the complaining seemed to take over and, and spoil it for a whole generation. So God says, I'll work with the kids then. He's always got a new generation. If one generation won't cooperate, he's like, I'll, I'm, I'm always making new ones. I'll start with the next guys. But don't miss your moment. And so we see that all through the Bible, we see that the power of words. We see that we, we had a great skit here. It was hilarious. These guys were blowing it up Friday night about uh, David and Goliath. Who remembers that? <laughs> and, uh, you know, Goliath is standing there mocking the children of Israel, the armies of the Lord, he's mocking, just boasting, calling. And when David comes out 
to fight him. He calls him a dog. See, that's what a lot of people are doing. That's what the Spirit wants to do is just mock the next generation. Are you kidding? They can, where are they going to go? I mean, a bunch of, you send a dog out to me? Yeah, we're, we're going to send out something. And they're the children of the Lord, generation zeal. You watch what happens. You're going to feel the zeal in just a moment. I'm telling you, the, the darkness doesn't know what's coming once a generation gets lit for Jesus. Like I always say, don't get, don't get woke, get lit. It's much better, trust me. And so the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, and in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. There's a prophetic generation coming. It's a promise. Your young men will see visions. Any young men with visions up in here? I'm telling you, ask the Lord for it. Every time you go to bed, every time, even daydreams, you, God will speak to you in the middle of the day, like boom. Oop, there it is. You got a vision that can shift and shake things. Uh, young men will see visions, old men will dream dreams. See, the two work together. Joshua and Caleb had a dream. We're going in. <laughs> I don't care what anyone says. Remember, they were the two spies with the good report who believed the report of the Lord, believed the word of the Lord when the Lord swears by his own name with lifted hand. I will take you into that land, and I will make it your home, a land of uh, with milk and honey. And, and so they believed. They just, and then there was 10 other spies who came back with an evil report saying, uh-uh, it can't happen. It's impossible. It looks too bad. We've gone too far. It looks too bad for America right now. Look at what's happening. Look at the nations. A lot of people are believing that kind of report. I'm telling you, there's a spirit of Joshua and Caleb that's coming on the church at such a time as this. Yeah, they're fighting the Nephilim. They're fighting giants. They're fighting crazy things, fortified cities. And here's these, these dust dwellers been doing laps in the desert, you know, 40, 40 years, 40 laps. Who knows? But here they come. But the Lord was with them when they finally came. And it was mostly a young generation that entered in with a few good ones that still believed. We got any few good ones of the older generation up in here? I believe so. And so you, the Bible says you're a chosen generation. Every generation is chosen for a purpose, for a high calling, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. We don't belong to ourselves. That, they, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Don't be afraid of the darkness. The, light shine, the wonderful light shines best in the darkness. The backdrop that we have right now is perfect for the gospel. It's perfect. It's like, this is going to work great, man. Just shine the light, the wonderful light. And so God wants to teach us how to uh, come from being victims to victors. From victims to victors. I want to talk to you about that. A couple steps here. Does that sound good? From, from wanderers to warriors. Can I keep going? From the frozen to the chosen. Oh, come on. From moving from grumbling to conquering. From deliverance to dominion. From hiding to abiding, from fleeing to fighting, from cowering to conquering, from being preoccupied, hey, they never get off their phone, it's like to occupying, to taking the land. Woo, come on, someone. <clears throat> from depressed to possessed, possessed by the Holy Spirit and possessing the land. Woo, I'm going to preach myself happy up in here in a minute. Woo, all right, we keep going. So here's the first step. You ready to do it? How to become from uh, being a, a victim to a victor. Step number one, remember God's goodness. Remember he is good, and he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. He's a good God. If you're not convinced in the goodness of God, you won't follow him. You won't go all the way. But if you're convinced, you go, man, he's the best I have. He's all I have. He's my all in all. He's my first and last. He's my alpha and my omega. Every breath comes from me. This life I've been given is a gift. Woo, and you believe that he is good, and then you start to taste and see. Sometimes you have to experience to have revelation. You experience God. How many of you young ones had an encounter with God this week and began to taste the goodness of God? So you're forever marked. And if you hold on to that, that's the key because sometimes people taste, and then after a while the fire fades, the flame flickers, and we forget. We have to cultivate the flame. We have to taste and see that God is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Make him your hiding place. Remember the goodness of God, okay? Um, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. There's not one generation that God hasn't bestowed his goodness and his faithfulness on. And we carry it on from one generation to the next. And it's a beautiful storyline. 
And so we have to do this. When it comes to God's goodness, we have to put it into remembrance. Remember all through the Old Testament, they kept having this strange habit of gathering rocks. They would gather a pile of rocks. They crossed the Jordan. They say, it's not enough to just cross the Jordan. That was epic. Let's take the rocks. Let's stack them up, and let's make an altar of remembrance. Let's remember that monumental moment that you believed for, that you fought for, and then God came through, and it's so easily. We can go two days down the road and kind of forget and start getting grumpy. Forget, wow, God just delivered me last week of that, and I spent months believing for that. And then all of a sudden the new problems come, the worries of this world that start to choke out the fruitfulness of our, and the maturity, the spiritual maturity. And so we got to build altars of remembrance, the goodness of God. we gotta, we got to be marked with it. Is this making sense to anyone? And that's something you, if you cultivate this discipline, it's a, it's a discipline, but it's an art. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of doing life, of just believing and, and celebrating the goodness of God time and time again. See, sometimes what we do, if we don't do that, we build monuments of disappointment, of confusion, of pain, of delay, of mystery. I don't know what happened to God. I don't know what happened to my prayers. I don't know if he's listening. That, had, that didn't come through. It didn't turn out... It wasn't my time frame. It just, you know, just, you know, these people disappointed me. I can't get over it. So we start heaping up rocks. Y'all getting this? Of disappointment. And that's where people start to fall apart. And all of a sudden you got this, 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 uh, this blundering thing right in the middle of your path that's there looking at you every day, kind of disheartening you and even terrorizing you like, well, are you sure God's good? Are you sure he's going to come through for you? You know, look at this problem. Look at this. This is still unresolved. Well, big deal. It's God's timeline. We have to trust. Someone say trust. If we trust, then we'll obey. If we, if we don't trust, we don't obey. We, do, we, we take matters into our own hands. Because the Lord asks us to do some crazy things along the way, some unorthodox things, some things that take faith, mountain-moving faith. Y'all getting quiet on me. Come on. All right. So the goodness of God, who's going to build altars of remembrance all the days of your life? God came through. God brought the victory. That's how you move from victim to victory. You just begin to celebrate. And you allow the mysteries to be the mysteries. God, I don't know what you're doing with that one, but I trust you. And let it work itself out. It will. And you'll look back and you'll say, man, he was faithful every step of the way. Point number two in becoming, going from victim to victor, you got to find and follow Joshua's and Caleb's. You got, I'll say that again. You got to find and follow Joshua's and Caleb's. I don't believe that young generation could have made it in on their, on their own. I believe God always has a remnant. He always has a leadership that you can look to from one generation to the next. And so there was a, there was a few that were marked. Remember, Moses didn't even make it in because of some attitude issues. So Jesus, first of all, says, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So we're called to follow Jesus, but he doesn't leave us as orphans. He sends the Holy Spirit, but he also sends leadership into our life, people that you can look to, people you can model after. Paul says, follow me as I follow the Lord. And some of us adults, we're like, oh, I don't know if I really want people following me. I don't know if I got my life together. Or not. Well, then get your life together. <laughs> You know, what are you waiting for? You're on a timeline in case you don't know. And then that you can say with confidence, follow me. I'm going after Jesus with all my heart. Does this make sense? And so uh, I touched on the thing of like, are you following the crowd or are you following the cloud? Are you, remember, they were led by the cloud. Was, the Lord was leading them. The presence of God would move on or the fire at night. Are we, we follow the fire or our, our own desire. We're either really going after Jesus, but the Lord uses people to lead us to come into our life. How many people are thankful for leadership in your life? People you can look to. They're not perfect. They're not Jesus, but they're important. They're key people to get you into that promised land. Come on. Woo! Lord, raise up the Joshua's and the Caleb's, those who believe your word, those who have a spirit of conquest, those of a different spirit than those who are cowarding and are fixing to fall in the desert. Deuteronomy 1, verse 25 says, um, oh, no, don't worry, but I'm not going to, I'm going to skip that portion. Uh, let's go on to, uh, I want to read you, uh, Numbers 14, 24 says, because my servant Caleb was of a different spirit and follows me, let's look into this. How does he follow the Lord? This different spirit, he follows me wholeheartedly. That, there's the difference. 
The half-hearted Christianity is not going to cut it in the days we're in. Have you noticed? You're either all in or you're not going to be in. I'm just telling you straight up. There's pressure coming. There's tribulation coming. There's persecution coming. That's okay. That's just normal Christianity. Just get ready for it. How do you do it? Just be all in wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. Woo! (laughs) I got nothing better with Jesus, and I'm happy about it. I'm not grieving over, oh, you know, I remember what Egypt used to be. We used to have onions and, and, and garlic, and, you know, they were just such petty things they started to think about. Yeah, we, you, we were slaves. We were in bondage. You know, we had e- evil taskmasters that were whooping on us. But, you know, at least we had some garlic. It's like, I'm telling you, we get so messed up by, by the, the lures of this world, by the, the petty things, things that won't matter for all of eternity. The materialism, we need an appetite for God, not the things of this world. Amen? And so uh, let's go on to the point number three. So that's uh, find some Joshua's and Caleb's and follow. Get, it, get involved. If you, if you see some people that are disheartened and they're trying to lead the church and they're, they're kind of going nowhere quick or they're just cowarding and they're just hiding out, they're just camping out or they're just playing politics or they're indifferent or they're just neutral, I would suggest to you, I'm just a suggestion, beware. <laughs> the time is too short to be playing anymore, guys. We got to be all in with Jesus. We got to follow those who are following Christ. Does this make sense? All right, all right. Point number three. We gotta, how are you going to go from victim to victor? You're going to believe the promises. You're going to believe the word of God. Believe the word of God. Jesus said, it is written, a man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And in today's world, you might go, well, we don't live on bread, and it's all GMO, messed up bread. It's like, I mean, what is he talking about? I mean, in America, it's an issue, right? Who lives on bread, right? Well, back in the day, we were actually with Papa Don Finto, and he was showing us his grinding mill and all this cool stuff. And the, what do they call Wheat berry and all this wholesome stuff that's got all the nutrients. If you're eating the right stuff, you can... You can live on bread, but he says even better than that, you better have the word of God. That's how you're going to live. That's how you're going to thrive. The, that which proceeds from the mouth of God. That, so that's the logos, the written word, and the rhema, the breath of God, what God is presently speaking now or speaking to you personally. you got to hear the voice of God. Know the voice of your shepherd. For all the promises of God are yes and amen in him. We talked about that. That was the first Monday night, the yes All the promises are good. God's got you. He's not going to hold anything back from you. Every promise is good in Christ Jesus. And so as we begin to stand on the word, when a lot of people are leaving the word or trying to redefine or rewrite the Bible or delete parts that they don't like, or I mean, they're just playing God. They think they're God. Well, let's just write it ourselves. I'm I'm telling you, (laughs) run from people that are acting like God, playing God, antichrist spirit. Does this make sense? Believe the word, it is true. It'll, it'll take you right, not to, those promises will take you into the promised land, into your inheritance, into your destiny that God has prepared for you. Point number four, don't despise, don't despise the promised land. And that's what this generation was doing, and they're grumbling, they're complaining. They were despising the good land, the pleasant land, and it says in Psalm, uh, Psalms 106, verse 24, it says, They despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his promise. They grumbled in their tents and did not obey the Lord. So he swore to them and with lifted, uplifted hand that he would make them fall in the desert, make their descendants fall among the nations and scatter them throughout the lands. So one thing we've got to remember is that the Lord hears. The Lord knows our heart. He knows The murmurings of our heart, the grumbling, the complaining. And again, we're going back to that. But it's so important that we keep a good attitude, that we walk by the promises, and that we understand that God is taking us to a pleasant place, a good place. Does this make sense to anyone? But let me tell you something. You don't just come waltzing in there. There's a reason why the Lord allowed there to be giants in the land, fortified cities, because they had to fight for it. They had to learn to fight. They had to fight the good fight of faith. They had to strap on a sword. They had to believe. They had to do the Jericho march. They had to do all kinds of things. 
that they had to learn to contend. This isn't just going to happen without a fight. How many people are ready to fight the good fight of faith for, for our land? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For those, uh, uh, I don't know if Jeff's here, but he's, he's praying and fasting right now, and a whole company of people are praying for America right now before July 4th contending, fighting the good fight of faith. I'm telling you guys, we're going to have to get used to, even young generation, I've been hearing reports of, of teenagers fasting, who ever heard of such a thing, fasting and praying and contending. I'm telling you, the spirit of supplication, prayer, intercession is going to come upon a generation, and they're not going to say, I'm going to, you don't have time to wait till you're 30 to pull it together. It's time to go after God with all of your heart, and we need you. The, the older generations need you to be in the fight. Is this making sense? Can I talk to young people like that? Y'all grown up enough to receive a word like that? It's exciting, isn't it? It's like, wait, I don't have to just amuse myself, entertain myself with diversions and just try to get over my apathetic depression. I can actually be in the battle. I can be in the fray. I believe the young generation is going to be like the vanguard, the first special forces that go in, the first ones that go in. Sometimes God will raise up those musicians, those unlikely ones. You say, like, just take those guys don't worry about all that. Just come to those, those who will lift up my name and declare the goodness of God and, and stay true to me, and God will shift the whole thing. God wants to shift America. It's not too late. Come on, y'all. It, it looked bleak for the children of Israel at that time. It looked crazy. It looked impossible. But the Lord shines best in those moments. So here's the thing. If you're not going to despise the pleasant land, the good land that God's going to take you to, the key to that is also don't look back. Don't look back. Don't go back. You remember Lot's wife? Remember Jesus even brought a special warning in the New Testament about a story of Sodom and Gomorrah when he told them, flee, the judgment was coming because of the evil in the land. And Lot's, for what, I don't know what she was looking at, what she was longing for, looking for, I don't know the issue, but bottom line is she becomes a pillar of salt, because she looks back when they're supposed to be lunging forward, escaping the immorality of their times, the idolatry, the sexual morality. He says, you know, run for your life. And she becomes a pillar of salt. And how many people know we're not to be pillars of salt? We're to be people of salt. We're to be people of salt, not pillars of salt. Some people, literally, they just get paralyzed because they're caught between two loves. Well, I love God. I love Jesus. But I love all these things of the world. So they're constantly going back and forth. They're not all in. God needs the people to put those blinders on like those good horses do and go straight on, straight in. Woo, come on, someone. So see the promises, even if there are strongholds and giants intimidating you, staring you down, calling you a dog, calling you no good. I'm telling you, that's when you hold fast to the promises and watch God put his might on display on your behalf. God has got a future and a hope for all of us. And if you think of anything less, you've missed it. If you buy any other narrative, God has a plan to bless you and prosper you. All you teenagers... You need to be convinced of that, man, that God is the best I have, and I celebrate him with all my heart. Older generation, don't, don't lose the fire. You need to be more fired up as every decade goes on in Jesus. We need to become that example that people can follow. We need, we need to be those burning ones, those shining ones. Woo, come on. So I believe that this morning, just with the, the power of these words, it's a remembrance of this story uh, that we can... We can look to this and we can be inspired. So I just want to pray and we're going to jump into the next part. But I just believe there's something right now. Someone's going to get an impartation as I pray right now. Father, I thank you. And let's, can we just have the, well, I tell you what, I'm not even going to make it just the Thunder Campers. Uh, anyone who's just filmed, man, I'm going to catch something right now. Just stand up. Any generation, whoever, whoever's in, get in. I'm just going to pray. Just stand if, you, if you're saying, I want this. Whatever's coming through the power of your word. Father God, we thank you, Father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All generations will serve you and work together for the greatest victory that this nation has ever known, for the greatest harvest that's at hand, Lord. We know the, the, the nations are in an uproar. Lord, people are, are shaken right now, and we thank you for that, Lord, because you are the rock, the rock eternal, the rock of ages, the king of ages, 
Mighty God, you are good and you are holy. You are righteous and we honored to serve you, God. We're honored to be part of your storyline in this generation, this great crescendo at the end of the age, God. We thank you for raising up special forces. Let the vanguard of God enter in with praise on their tongues, with victory on their hearts, Lord. No longer victims. No longer woe is me, but wow is me. I get to follow Jesus, the invincible king. <laughs> He's never lost a battle if you're on his side. You win. You win. Guaranteed. Yeah, you might suffer. You will suffer. There will be troubles. There will be hardships. There will be disappointments. But we make monuments of faithfulness of God. And we celebrate. He came through. He kept his word. He was good to us. And we celebrate. We build up those stones. Lord, let this this church be a pile of living stones that Sing your praise and declare your goodness, Lord. Yeah, we're still going through things. We're still waiting on you for certain promises. But, Lord, we celebrate you. Lord, you're the best that we have. No one compares to you, mighty God. No one compares to you. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You call us out. You call us sons and daughters. A chosen generation. A royal priesthood people belonging to you. We don't belong to ourselves. We bow to you. We revere you, God. Our life is not our own. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Just receive now. Just breathe in. Just breathe in a different spirit. Breathe in that conquering spirit. More than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord. There's land yet to be conquered. There's dreams yet to be realized. And God says, I want to use you I just think there's a moment of just getting rid of disappointments. Some, some of you, I just see like, a, like it's kind of interesting, but in the spirit, I just see like uh, scorpion stings, like scorpion stings and, and the poison of, of snakes, bitterness that's gotten in. And, I, and the Lord says, that's not for you. You're to, you're to trample on snakes and scorpions. That's supposed to be under your feet, not in, in, your, in your soul. So I feel like there's a moment of extracting poisons and the sting of life and that the Lord wants to bring a, a beautiful cleansing and a healing right now that you'd be as good as new, fresh and young and ready to run. doesn't matter what age you are. Your spirit, man, be so young and so fresh and so excited knowing that the promised land is at hand, a land flowing with milk and honey and the goodness of the Lord. The victory of the Lord is yours. No longer victims, no longer poisoned by this world. So, Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray for a washing right now, a cleansing, Lord, an extracting of the sting and the poison, Lord. Father, we go through things, and you know it, Lord, but you've given us a full armor, Lord. Let us be faithful to wear it now, Lord, into the victory of the Lord. And we thank you for this. Please be seated. <clears throat>